Hey you, are you wasting your time on social media again? Your brothers and sisters in the Islam net from Norway are establishing a masjid, a dawah center. Establishing a masjid to convey the message of Islam is one of the best deeds a Muslim can do. There's a huge need for it in Norway. You know this and I know this. So that makes the reward even greater. So give generously and Allah Azza wa Jal will give you even more. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. How are you guys doing? I've come here from the uh, United Kingdom. Started in Norway and we've been doing a dawah expedition, really. Going to different places in the Scandinavian region. Uh, to be honest with you, I forget what the name of this uh, city is. What's this place? Karlstad? It's called something like that. But it's, uh, mashallah, I was very surprised to even find the Muslim population here. I, was, uh, I thought there would be no Muslims. I was... Uh, Searching whether there's Muslims here or no Muslims here, but uh, it's very I'm very glad to see that there's a mashallah thriving Muslim population And I guess what I want to say is that um, There's a few things I want to say that like we've been coming and doing a bit of research ourselves here. Okay, the research is about purposefulness people have in This country become the most atheistic one of the most atheistic countries irreligious countries on the face of the planet and I went, we went around in different parts of Norway and Sweden asking people really what the purpose of their lives were and connecting the idea of purpose and meaning of one's life with suicide. With the idea that because many of you will know, Sweden is one of the countries that people kill themselves, they end up on the most actually, pound for pound. And so we wanted to see if there was a connection. Most people themselves believed that there was a connection. Most people, atheists that we spoke to, and people that didn't have a religion, they saw a connection between having no meaning in life, having no purpose in life, and this idea of hopelessness, or this idea of being depressed to the point where one would commit suicide. So this is what we found. And then we would propose to them, so therefore what would make your life better? Then having purpose would make your life better. And obviously, us as Muslims, the biggest blessing of all is Islam. And not least because it gives us purpose, gives us a reason to live. Now, I wanted to give you one argument that I have been thinking about and talking about with some of my friends about how to prove that life has purpose from a rational perspective. Because, of course, if someone, if I asked you, why, um, why do you know that you have purpose? So, so, for example, let me ask you, what's your name in the front here? Salman. Jamal, where are you from? What country? MashaAllah, you know, may Allah, you know, give victory to the people of Palestine. So if I were to ask you, what's your purpose of life? What would you say? Okay, what's your meaning in life? What would you, what you want to do here in life? Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Okay, so you would say, We have not created the jinn and the human being except that they may worship me. Okay, but if you go to an atheist and you say to him, you know, in the Quran it says, Umma khalaqtul jinn wal He said, I don't care what the Quran says. I don't believe in Quran. That's what they say. So my, my question is, how do we bring to an atheist, okay, or someone who doesn't believe in God, this idea that, like, how can we prove? So I'm, I'm giving you an argument here. The argument is as follows. Number one, the universe which we live in has design. Okay. What do we mean by that? The universe is finely tuned to allow life to exist. No one can deny this. No atheist can deny this. Because why? We have life in the universe. We have human life. We have animal life. We have different kinds of life. Yes? We have animals in this uh, universe, right? We have humans, yeah? Nobody can say there's no life. No, there is life, yes? Even the atheist must admit. Life and death are two things no atheist can deny, right? So number one is, there is life in the universe. The universe which we live in, the earth on which we live in, in the universe which we live in, is finely tuned to allow life to exist. If it could have been, could not have been that you have a universe which has no life, for example. Right? It could have been a universe which was volatile, which allowed no life. But it just so happened that we have a universe that allowed what? That allowed life. So now we ask, what does this show? What does this show us? It shows us a few things, actually. Number one, it shows us that 
something proportioned the universe. Now, I'll explain what I mean by this. If I ask an atheist, what's your explanation? What is your explanation for why the universe is finely tuned to allow life to exist? What can he say? There's only three options. There's no fourth option. Number one option, it is random thing. It just happened like that. Ashwai, it happened like that, no problem. It's a random thing, Yani, it's no problem. Okay, the second option is, they can say it was meant to be like that by force, necessity. And the third option is to say, actually, there was a designer, there's a lawmaker that made it like that. Which has intelligence, which has knowledge. So you have three options. But in truth, you only have one option. You don't have three options. Let me tell you why. Because if you say, well, this randomness it made the universe, I say to you, what is the proof that there's something called randomness? Because you are an atheist, for example, I would say. You're an atheist, so you believe that in order to believe in something, you have to put it under a microscope. Randomness is not something you can put under a microscope. Randomness doesn't exist. There's no such thing as randomness. There's no such thing. There's no, no such thing as called randomness. So that's number one. Option is gone. He has to prove to you there's something called randomness. Chance. It happened by chance. By luck. No, it didn't. You have to prove to me there's somebody called luck. Or chance. Or randomness, which I can investigate. There's no randomness. Khalas. That's the first option gone. It happened by force. But how did it happen by force? It's not an explanation at all. So you're left with the only explanation, which is that you have a knowledge... Something or someone with knowledge made the universe, proportioned it, and made it such a way, stable, uniform, and regular, so that the universe can have life. There's no other option. There is no other option. Khalas. So something or someone made the universe with knowledge. Ilm. This is min sifat Allah ta'ala. That he is al-alim. Okay, that he is the knowledgeable one. Already we've established to the atheist that he's alim. From one looking at the universe only. We only look at the universe, we established one of the names of Allah. But he couldn't have changed, the universe couldn't have changed from one thing to another. Except if it changed from someone who was able to change something. So this is quwa and qudra. So we're already... How could the universe even move from one thing to another? You cannot move unless you have power and strength. So we established for the atheists, quwa and qudra. So what do we have? We have ilm. We have quwa and we have qudra. Uh, the Quran also states, and it's a beautiful argument. Question? I will do both. I, I will do English first, and then I will do Arabic after. Okay? Just so everybody can understand. So, do you understand? You have ilm, quwa, and qudra. You have these. Okay. So why can not be more than one of them? Because if there was more than one of them, there would be more than one decision maker. And if there's more than one decision maker, you would not have uniformity. Because that's what the Quran says. It says that, if there was law kana fihima alihatun, yeah, if it, was, if it was other than Allah, the universe and the heavens and the earth would have been destroyed. You see, it would have been destroyed. Why? Because there'd be more than one decision maker. And if the universe had more than one decision maker, it could not be uniform. The laws cannot be one laws. There's only one laws for the universe. It's called uniformity. The, in, the evidence of one God is that there is one laws. That's the evidence. The Quran tells you that. Five. So we already have ilm, qudra, quwa. And wahdaniya, the oneness of God. Wahdaniya as well, which is the one he's uh, the one and only. Fayyib. But there's something else, and this I'm going to connect it to purpose now. The universe has things in the right place. For what purpose? For the purpose of allowing human life. Yani, if things were a different place, the universe could not allow human life. If they were in the wrong place for that purpose, 
the universe would not allow human life. For example, I'm drinking a cup of water now, yes? Any excuse? It's the water from the tap is fantastic here in Sweden. Not as good as in Norway. But that's a different question. <laughs> I think I just tried it now. This is like, you know, it's okay. Not like Norway one is a bit better. This water, this cup of water, this cup of water, water, it is not blowing up in my face now. I'm not changing into a dragon in your face, Yanni. I'm not changing. Things are staying the same. Why? Because there are laws of nature, and that's one laws of nature, staying the same. Okay. Now, this shows you that the, pl- the things are in the right place to disallow disorder. In order for life to continue to exist. And this is called hikmah. Because al-hikmah is wisdom. And in Arabic, the wisdom of Allah is wad'u shay'i fi makanihi sahih. To put something in its right place. Ha. To put something in its right place. What's the evidence of Allah's wisdom? The, the, the sifa of hikmah. The evidence is that everything in, is in its right place to allow human life. Isn't that evidence? It's evidence. But then if we have a deity or an entity which is all-knowing, all-seeing, let's say, but let's, let's not say seeing because we haven't established that yet. All-knowing, all-powerful, that has qudra and has quwa and has hikmah, then the question is, is it conceivable? Can you imagine that such a deity would create the universe and not allow a purpose, not assign a purpose for the human being. Yani, this cup, what is the purpose of this cup? The, the purpose of the cup is that you can put water or juice or fluids inside so that somebody like me can have his excuse. To drink the water. So the cup has a purpose. So... The cup has a purpose because human being has assigned the purpose to it. If we have established that human beings come from this higher source, then in Bab Aula we would say, human be- that human being must have a purpose. Human being must have a purpose. So the question is, what is the purpose of life? And that's why when Allah he answers this question, He answers it in questions. He, he asks us questions. Uh, for, for example, أَيَحْسَبُ insan a يُتْرَكَ suda. This is a question of Surah Qiyamah. Does the human being think he will be left alone without purpose? Is this imaginable thought? That a human being can be left without purpose? The cup has a purpose. That I have put the, assigned the purpose for the cup. Human being has assigned the purpose for the cup, has shaped the cup so that it has a purpose. But Allah has not shaped me so I can have a purpose. The one who has wisdom and ilm and quwa and qudra has not shaped the universe and shaped the human being so that he has a purpose. Was he not something which is like sperms emitted? And then he made him into a clot and he, he formed him. And Allah is showing us the khalq. He created the human being. And this is the Quranic argument. If God can assign purpose through creation, then you can establish purpose for yourself. Another question Allah asked. Do you think you have been created purposeless, purpose, without any purpose, and that you will not come back to us? So Allah, the way He deals with this issue, He doesn't tell you the answer. He asks you the questions. Which is why I went to the streets today, and I didn't give anybody the answer. I, I gave them only the question, because that's what Allah does with us in the Quran. You know, it's a question, it's not an answer. Because sometimes asking a question is better than giving an answer. Does this make sense? 
So this is, we're living in the country with the least amount of purpose. It's important that we understand our own purpose and that we give that purpose to other people. This is what I wanted to tell you today. I'll quickly do a translation in Arabic. Yes, sir. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for all that. Part. Thank you. I was sure that you give you that. Alhamdulillah. Also. Thank you. Uh, I only have a, a, one issue that I'm always asking myself, and I even wanted to remind you about it, but you can't. Uh, Allah, Allah. <laughs> Mashallah. Go on. So, basically, sometimes uh, the original purpose is to guide people, right? But sometimes I feel that your answer is more of. Uh, it's not the purpose behind it is not to guide them as if you just give up on that person and you are now just making him shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why does it go that way? Sometimes you have to deal with different people in different ways. Likulli maqam and maqal, as the Arabs say. Yeah. If someone is, you you have to look. You have to be a kind of um, psychoanalyst of some sorts. So you analyze the behavior of a person. If somebody is coming to do hujum on you, to attack you, to, you know, to, to rid, rid, ridicule from the religion of Islam, at that point, my, my gharad, if you like, my aim is not to guide him or to tell him about Islam. It's to humiliate him. You know, it's, that, I'll be honest with you. Why? Because now he's, try, he's, he's doing it, yani, he's uh, attacking Islam, he's attacking the Muslim people. He's, let, let me give you one thing Ibn Taymiyyah said. Ibn Taymiyyah, a famous scholar of the uh, 13th century. He said, and this might be an exaggeration, but I'll tell you, Yani. He said, it is worse that one person says something bad about the Prophet than a thousand people become Muslim. Does this make sense? Yani, if a thousand people become Muslim, but one kafir, he says something bad about Islam, we would rather have one thousand people not become Muslim and this one will shut his mouth. That's how much the, the honor of the Prophet is uh, to the scholars and to the Sahaba and to these kinds of people. You see? And there's many hadiths I can bring with the Sahaba and what, how they react. So I won't do it now because some children here and some stuff. Yeah, Maybe you know them. You know? <laughs> Maybe you know them. But the idea is that there's a, there's a point where you are doing da'wah. A da'iyah must know when to give da'wah and when to attack the person and when to befriend the person and when to be nice and when to be good. Sometimes I get this wrong myself. I get it wrong all the time. Sometimes I'm harsh with the good guy. I'm good with the harsh guy. And everyone has this problem. You know? Uh, but this is something I'm working on. But this is the idea. The idea is that if I see that the person, his, his objective is to attack Islam, I don't, I don't want to do da'wah to him now. I want to antaqisu min sha'nihi. I want to humiliate him. And I'll be honest with you. But can you the question? Why can't the So humiliate him in front of more people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So humiliate him in front of so many people. More likes, more views. Yeah, more like movies. Someone watched that video and told me that video and then I had a negative opinion about it. How do you watch like many videos then you see that the purpose is totally different? I agree, but th let me tell you something, yeah? If somebody, he, sorry to say, he swore at your mom, he said bad thing about your mom, and you heard him say bad thing about your mom this time. Now this guy, he comes in the, in the street in front of everyone. It's your turn to humiliate him. You humiliate him now, yeah? Tayyib, yani. Now, you humiliate him, it's on camera, everyone can see, right? He said something bad about your mom. He said some, sorry to say, very bad things, sexual things, some whatever, yeah? So you humiliate him in front of millions of people to teach him a lesson and to teach people like him a lesson, yeah? Taib, if someone just see that video of you attacking him, will you care? Will you care? No, you say, it's my mom, I don't care. If everybody they see and they say I'm a bad guy, I don't care, you know? The same thing, he's like Prophet Muhammad is more than a thousand mothers, four million mothers, all of our mothers together. That's the truth. So for me, I'll be honest with you, yes, I understand some people criticize the, the idea of me attacking somebody, but the moment I see that they do Sab bin Nabi or they do attack of Islam or they want to remove the Muslims or something like that, my aim really isn't necessarily to only give them da'wah. I can give them da'wah privately. A lot of these enemies of Islam, I give them da'wah privately, but publicly it's humiliation. That's my strategy with them. And it works. They respect me. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, whoever builds a mosque for Allah, Allah will build for him a similar house in Jannah. And we know the great reward that will not only be gained, but rather will fill your grave after your death. Whenever someone prays there, whenever someone gives shahada, 
in the masjid, whenever someone learns something in the masjid, yes, that will be something that you'll have on your scale.